Hello once again, all my theatric friends. It is I, the theatric dyspraxic, here for another episode of my podcast. I don't have much prepared, but I'm just going to wing it. And that's, well, that's pretty much what dyspraxics do all the time, is we wing it, and then we do things awkwardly, and, you know, we just kind of get through the mayhem that ensues. Um, So, once again, I don't have a guest. Um, I'm not going to have a guest on all of my podcast episodes. Um, It's basically going to be, if people want to come on, and and discuss something a particular topic primarily doing having to do with dyspraxia or dyspraxia related or neuro you know related to neurodivergency or whatever or neurodiversity I should say um, but people can come on and talk about anything for all I care as long as it's a, a topic that I can discuss myself uh, mental health is kind of wrapped into all of that as well. So it does. You don't have to have a, a neurological disorder or developmental disorder to be on my show. You know, you can talk about depression. You can talk about uh, body dysmorphia. Anything. And anyway, but today I'm going to be doing another edition of theatric readings, and uh, it's going to be a little bit different today. I have two things that I'm going to read, or mm, I guess I could say three, but Two of those things are, are very, they're very related to each other. Um, but the first thing I'm going to read, I'm going to read a short uh, article written by a friend of mine from the Dyspraxic Circle named uh, Rosemary Richings. She is a blogger and a freelance writer. Uh, she's from Canada, so she's one of the only people that, uh, Dyspraxics that I know that are from the, from North America. So she's more from my neck of the woods than some of these other people that I know who are from the UK. But Nothing wrong with that. It's just that we have different experiences because we're from different uh, continents. And, uh, of course, uh, Rosemary and I have different experiences because she's from Canada and I'm from the U.S. And we both just have different experiences as far as dyspraxia awareness. She has also written a book, which hasn't been published yet, but hopefully will be released in the near future. And when it does, I hope to have her on my podcast for an interview. We've done a live stream before on my Instagram, before I started doing this podcast. And uh, just like me, I've also started writing a book about my experiences, but I'm sure they're going to be very different. But it'll be interesting to see when that uh, manages to come out. But I'm going to be reading something that she wrote and I'm also going to be reading uh, something that somebody wanted me to read on my podcast. Um, they wish to remain anonymous, so I'm not going to mention the name of the person who wrote it. But it is a tribute to a woman named Mary Colley, who has done a lot of amazing things for dyspraxia awareness and uh, life with dyspraxia and the dyspraxic uh, community. Um, and she is also, well, she's mainly written a book, uh, called Living with Dyspraxia, a guide for adults with developmental dyspraxia. Unfortunately, she passed away about 10 years ago. Um, but she managed to touch a lot of people's lives and made a huge impact on the dyspraxic community and, and raising awareness and understanding for dyspraxia, which did not really have much of awareness at all before she came along um and the person who wrote the the tribute that i'm going to read was a very good friend of hers knew her personally so i'm going to be doing a reading of that but first i'm going to read this article by rosemary richings the title is called what you need to know about the glue of disability online movement and advocacy unity i butchered that already I'm going to provide a link to this article uh, and her blog uh, in the description of my YouTube edit for this. But let me go ahead and get started. Of course, these are both cold readings, so I apologize if I uh, mess anything up, if I mispronounce anything, or I struggle with any of the reading. Just because it's my first time reading either one of these, so I will probably make a mistake here and there. But hopefully you enjoy my readings of this. Ah! So here's the article. I am not a disability studies PhD, nor am I a medical professional. So there are moments where I feel like an imposter when I talk about disability-related issues. Although there is something extremely valuable I bring to the conversation, I 
I already messed that up. Lived. Although there is something extremely valuable I bring to the conversation. Lived experience. As I mentioned before, I am a person who lives with dyspraxia. For such a long time, I also lived with a severe case of anemia. The anemia made me physically weak and prone to fainting every time I had my period. It started when I was 13 years old and ended when I was 18 years old. I knew it had gotten really bad when I visited a nurse at my local community health center. After noticing that I was really pale and the hemoglobin levels in my bloodstream were dangerously low, they told me to go to the hospital. Several blood transfusions and tests later, an OBGYN prescribed the birth control pill and the anemia has been non-existent ever since. I also have an inner circle where a majority are either neurodiverse or have some sort of mental health condition. Not to mention, I am married to someone with type 1 diabetes who was one of the founding trustees of the hashtag insulin for all movement. I watched the movement grow and felt like I learned a lot from both the right and wrong choices of everyone involved. Currently, I am a major contribution to the events and projects of the dyspraxic circle wing of the hashtag dyspraxia, hashtag neurodiverse squad movement. Our community's awareness week is in full swing, and I couldn't be any more proud of the people involved although I am also slightly afraid of what might happen with a crucial part of it, our ability to create unity. Let's start with why it's a good thing. The best part of all this is that we can challenge cultural and physical barriers. There's something enormously beautiful about that in an era of COVID-19, because staying far apart and covering our faces is normalized for everyone's safety. Making an intimate, emotional connection with another human being outside your own household is suddenly a risky endeavor. However, in the disability community, technology creates a safe loophole. I can ask someone for advice and support without leaving the house or purchasing a plane, bus, or train ticket. The best part of it is that I can do all of that while doing the most universally important thing of all, looking people in the eye and sharing a moment. But what makes it a bad thing? Unity can also scare away key allies of a movement in overwhelmingly powerful ways. All that energy needs to be harnessed for good, but sometimes intentions can be twisted in toxic directions very easily. A great example of this is a concept my husband and I call Struggle Olympics, aka Privilege Olympics. The Struggle Olympics is a competition for attention and pity. In this competition, people try to outdo each other by claiming that their struggle is more severe or valid than someone else's. The logic of this silly notion, in a nutshell, is the following. Everyone involved may share a mutual disability, but everything from race, gender, and sexual orientation to someone's social class determine which perspectives are worth paying attention to. In the dyspraxia community specifically, I try to avoid that attitude as well, with something that is a key part of that community, the timing of people's diagnosis, and if they're diagnosed, or a self-diagnosis. This can be a very polarizing issue because awareness is still a problem. Unfortunately, even in public healthcare systems like Canada and the UK, diagnosis and treatment can be an out-of-pocket expense. However, all those identity politics aspects can be harnessed in positive ways, it's why I think it's fine for some events to be a- for anyone living with dyspraxia, and some events being for a specific gender, geographic location, race, sexual orientation, etc. To me, things like women-only events and events only for the LGBTQ community are a bit like bars or pubs for people from a specific community. It's why I didn't, that's why I didn't go to a gay bar until a few years ago. I'm not gay or a man, so I wanted to respect the gay gay male community's right to have their own safe space to meet people just like them. First time I ever went to a gay bar, I was invited. I was out on Halloween night with two gay men, and they were introducing me to a Toronto neighborhood with a vibrant and proud gay scene. Their favorite gay bar was nearby, and they encouraged me to come with them. The most important lesson that can be learned from this? We need to support not 
demonize people who want to create some groups and events for all dyspraxics, and some groups and events for dyspraxics from specific cultural groups, because sometimes our differences create differences in people's experiences. However, those differences can also help us to see things from a whole new perspective. Not to mention, some people feel safer sharing their experiences in groups that are most like them. The first time I visited a Muslim-dominated country, this was a basic truth I had to accept. Little things that you can't apply to the Western world to Western world viewpoints to came up. Oh my God! Little things that you can't apply Western world viewpoints to ca to came up. Two came up. Oh my God! I'm so sorry. Like the expectation that women were expected to sit in the back of cabs driven by men and vice versa. Suddenly I saw women or men only spaces from an entirely different point of view. In other words, it just wasn't a big deal to me anymore. Throughout the pandemic, CBC, one of Canada's most well-known news outlets, has talked a lot about how we live in unprecedented times. Although the way I see it, the unprecedented nature of all of it, is about a lot more than this nasty virus. It's also about how we treat each other. The last thing we need is for everything that can be difficult about living with a disability to be a lot worse than it needs to be. We need each other to accomplish actual lasting change. Because no one can do this alone. So stop fighting amongst each other. All that passion needs to be channeled into something a lot more important. Fighting against the awful behavior of people who have the power to create schools, workplaces, and political policies that don't benefit people with disabilities and their families. Rosemary Richings is a freelance content marketing consultant, writer, and editor, currently seeking literary agent representation for her memoir on living with dyspraxia, which hopefully you'll be able to find soon. But I totally understand what she was talking about. And again, I apologize for some of the parts that were a bit rough in the reading. It's cold reading, so, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world for me uh, to do cold readings. That's why I suck at auditions when I'm trying to audition for stuff, you know, because I have to read it cold and I get so nervous doing it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think anybody should be divisive, especially in a community where everybody's sort of marginalized uh, nobody really understands us as dyspraxics in the neurodiverse community. Um, and we're just, you know, in general. And most of us live in a world of isolation. And there should be no reason why people shouldn't feel like they can't, like they need to be divided amongst each other in the dyspraxic community. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having specific kinds of groups. Because I'll tell you this. From an American perspective, like, I am so happy that I have a, a community and a circle of, of uh, companions and, and confidants to, uh, to, to discuss living with dyspraxia and to relate to. But as an American, being that most of the people in these groups are from the UK and are English or British or Irish or whatever... Uh, as great as it is, it would be nice to meet more Americans with dyspraxia because I'm like the only one in the group and in the community that is actually from America who actually contributes anything anyway. So that's the thing that's difficult about, uh, you know, being a part of the, the wide group. And again, I don't know what I'm saying, and if I, I, I'm there's a reason I don't play these back because I sound like an idiot whenever I talk, just out of my ass. But um, being part of a, a group is great, but sometimes you need par to be part of a, a subcategory of that group if that makes sense. You know, like I would love to meet more people from the United States who have dyspraxia and can relate to the American experience of living with dyspraxia. Because oftentimes when we have like these discussions, they're very particularly pertaining to uh, the UK and the National Health Service and, and all that. And I just don't have anything to contribute to conversations like that because I don't relate because I'm from a different country and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, 
it's great to have different experiences and, and having great uh, having our own differences. But sometimes you need to also have people that are more like you, you know, as far as like your geography or your gender or, um, you know, your race, perhaps. So I understand that completely. And uh, yeah, that was a great article to read. I was happy to share that for you. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start um, discussing the next part of this. All blah, blah, blah. I should prepare for these types of things more, but I don't because I'm too lazy and disorganized to, uh, you know, to know what I'm doing. <laughs> so anyway, I've already lost you by this point. Nobody's listening at this point. So it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I can I can be a screw up. I can be Mr. Mess Up. That's okay. It's okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to, to be reading is uh, the tribute to Mary Colley. Um, now, I have to be clear right off the bat. I don't really... I'm not that familiar with Mary Colley. Um, I, the only thing I know of her is that she's written a book. And uh, so I'm probably going to be learning a lot about her from this tribute that my friend, who, again, wished to remain anonymous, uh, wrote about her. Um, but I don't feel qualified in really going into too much information about who she was. Uh, I just know that she she passed away about 10 years ago, and she wrote this book called Living with Dyspraxia, A Guide for Adults with Developmental Dyspraxia, which came out in 2006 about four years before she passed away. But before I read this uh, little tribute that my friend wrote, I'm going to read her description and uh, a couple of reviews, short reviews of her book on Amazon. So the book is, again, it's titled Living with Dyspraxia. And the description says... For people with developmental dyspraxia, everyday life can pose a multitude of problems. Tasks the majority of people would find simple can often be taxing and fraught with difficulty. Living with dyspraxia was written to help all adults with dyspraxia tackle that the everyday situations that many people take for granted. It is full of practical advice on everything from getting a diagnosis to learning how to manage household chores. Important topics are addressed, such as self-esteem, whether to disclose your condition within the workplace, how to communicate more effectively, and also how dyspraxia often interacts with other conditions, such as dyslexia, ADHD, and Asperger's syndrome. This practical resource will be, use, will be of use to adults with dyspraxia, the professionals and families, families members who come into contact with them, as well as those who simply wish to learn more about dyspraxia. Um, so again, you know, that's a basic overview of, of dyspraxia. Uh, and I'm sure this book has a lot of useful information. I don't know how much of it would apply to me because I'm sure that it's written from a UK perspective. So it's probably more about how things are, uh, you know, run in that country as opposed to, uh, you know, how it is over here. So I don't know how much would be helpful for Americans, but I'm sure there's a lot. Uh, that would be universally beneficial. Um, I would buy it if I had any money, but I don't. And uh, But it would be an interesting read, I am sure. And let me go to a couple of the reviews. Uh, also, another great book that I did buy at one point that I was reading uh, that I see all you know also listed here is Caged in Chaos by Victoria Biggs. And that's a really good book. It's a book that was actually written from the perspective of a teenager with dyspraxia and her experiences, which, you know, is definitely a unique perspective. The book offers excellent advice throughout numerous areas of difficulty, including organization of both self and home, communication and relationships, leisure activities, study skills, and very useful tips on how to cope with the workplace. The clarity with which the information is presented not only helps those who struggle to cope with dyspraxia, but also enables those with a wider interest in improving generic provision to understand the day-to-day -day issues faced by the adult with DCD or dyspraxia. 
DCD as in Developmental Coordination Disorder. The information given is both positive and practical. Book Description Concise Handbook to Help Adults Living with Dyspraxia Understand the Condition and Improve Their Everyday Living Activities From the Author Mary Colley was diagnosed with dyspraxia as well as ADHD and dyslexia in her mid-40s. She helped set up the Dyspraxia Foundation Adult Support Group and achieved a diploma in specific learning difficulties at the Hornsby Center. She went on to help form Developmental Adult Neurodiversity Association, a charity working with adults with dyslexia, dyspraxia, Asperger's syndrome, ADHD, ADD, and related sim- syndromes. Syndromes. She campaigned tirelessly to raise awareness of dyspraxia and other specific learning difficulties via print, radio, and national media. Okay. All right. Let's go down to some of these customer reviews. Uh, This book seemed to be written for adults who are only just finding out why they are different and what to do, where to go, and what to expect. The writer speaks clearly without making the reader dig for meaning. Explanations were easy to understand. And then it continues, and I'm not going to go to the rest of it very difficult to find books on this topic for adults this one is from britain and fairly old but it is worth reading if you have this problem good overview a book that should have been titled and promoted for young readers basic information here is available free online the rest is mostly common sense well all right everybody has a right to their opinion you know i mean i haven't read it i don't you know i don't know i guess it's a matter of of just perspective uh, many practical tips and easy to read, just the addresses they recommend are from UK. The book shared so much information and answered questions that we didn't know that we should ask. I do wish that the pages didn't start to fall out on the first time reading it. You may have gotten an old copy. I mean, that that just sounds like bad luck. <laughs> anyway, um, this book made me feel... ooh. This is a one star. This book made me feel worse than I already did. I never felt so patronized in my life. It's like being told how to breathe. Instructions on how to brush my teeth. I've got fine motor control issues. I'm not an idiot. As an antidote to missing social cues, it suggests that I ask a friend for a video of them interacting with others. Yeah, because people don't think I'm odd enough already without asking them that. Waste of money, waste of time, save yours, and avoid this pile of steaming condensation. Con- condensation, masquerading as a self-help book. Okay. As an adult who has just learned the specifics of dyspraxia and how they apply to me, this book has been invaluable. After 30 plus years of trying to piece the puzzle together regarding what's wrong with me, reading this book has helped fill in those final segments. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's about enough uh, of reading the those types of things, eh, right? Now I'm going to be reading this uh, lovely tribute from my friend. And uh, again, it's uh, going to be a cold reading. First time I'm looking at it, so I will probably make some reading mistakes here and there. And I'm too lazy to go back and edit all of those out. Also, I hate hearing the sound of my voice, so I don't usually edit my podcast unless... It's with a guest who wishes to cut something out, but that hasn't really happened yet. Um, so yeah, this is the tribute for uh, Mary Colley. And the person who wrote this knew her very personally, so it's going to be a very personal experience for him. So tribute to Mary Colley. Good evening. I am honored, humbled, and delighted to share with you this tribute to dear Mary. It goes without saying, but I will say it anyway, that no words can do justice to the fantastic and inspiring person Mary was. I feel so privileged to have known her for 12 years, and I am sure many people on tonight's Zoom feel the same way that I do. Uh, I suppose this is something he wrote for a tribute for her over Zoom. She was so precious to all those who suffered and struggled with dyspraxia, and indeed, 
and her passing has left a chasm that cannot be filled even though it has been a decade since she left us. To me, Mary was firstly someone I offloaded my problems with dyspraxia to, then a friend, and then someone far more special than that. To me, and I am sure many others, many other people, both inside and outside of DA and DA, Mary was a was really quite a mother figure and wanted to help everyone greatly, as she herself knew only too well what it was like to have dyspraxia and suffer and the suffering and frustrations in life that come with it. For those of you that knew her, Mary will have affected your lives in so many different ways, and I know you will share these experiences with one another at some point, but I hope this tribute will chime with you or perhaps fill in some of the gaps in her wonderful and servant heart in life. Particularly tonight, for those of you that didn't know her personally. I first met Mary in the summer of 1998, just after I had sat my A-levels. I had already been diagnosed with dyspraxia at the age of 13, and had already had many problems having had dyspraxia. My hand-to-eye coordination was poor, and I had been picked on at school for being different. And I wasn't really sure why, but I think it was mainly because I was different and lacked social skills or norms. My f initial first impression of Mary was that she was slightly different herself, and indeed rather loud. But as soon as I had explained to her about my life history, she explained without hesitation about her own experiences of being picked on and bullied, mainly because she was different, as well as the fact that she had poor coordination issues too, and other struggles such as lack of organization. I was quite struck with her caring and listening ear, and she didn't judge me at all. She just understood in a way that no one had until that point in my life. She understood that having dyspraxia isn't just a coordination problem. It affects many individuals in many different ways on a daily basis. She told me more about her struggles. For example, she struggled to use a mobile phone and also shared with me on our mutual understanding of getting lost easily and a bizarrely obsessive way of thinking. For example, having to get every travel magazine and the travel agents. Mary had actively pursued a diagnosis herself, having been labeled clumsy as a child. And when she was diagnosed at the age of 43, it came as a massive relief to her. As the diagnosis summed up and explained her whole life in an instant, she also stated she had a diagnosis of attention deficit disorder and thought it possible that I might have it as well. Mary explained to me in more depth that dyspraxia wasn't merely poor coordination or clumsy child syndrome. It is also a delay or disorder of the planning and or execution of complex movements. In any individual, it may devel be developmental, part of an individual's makeup, or indeed even genetic. Or it can be as a result of a stroke or brain injury. It affects people in many ways. For example, in terms of gross motor coordination skills, an individual would suffer poor balance, which would make riding a bike difficult, and similar, similarly difficult with hand-to-eye coordination, which would cause problems with catching a ball and batting in cricket, and in turn driving a car. For example, getting confused with left and right and getting confused easily. In terms of motor coordination skills, there are symptoms, for example, a poor pen grip and problems with typing, handwriting, and drawing. Perhaps most frustratingly, a person with dyspraxia may have trouble with speech and language. For example, talking continuously, repeating themselves and interrupting, as well as organizing the content of their speech. And in my case, sometimes jumping quickly from subject to subject in mid-conversation. In addition, there are problems with visual perception, such as poor map reading and getting lost easily if walking in an unfamiliar area. In terms of learning, thought, and memory, there are problems with a poor short-term memory and following instructions, particularly if they are not written down. She did also helpfully point out to me that many people don't just have dyspraxia, don't just have dyspraxia, they also have it hand-in-hand -hand with another condition such as dyslexia, ADHD, or Asperger's syndrome, which of course is now just known as uh, high-functioning autism. 
From the moment she was diagnosed, Mary was relieved as it explained all her life, and she resolutely resolved to help others. In addition, every individual is different in terms of their severity. And then he shows a, a diagram, uh, the makeup of neurodiversity. Uh, this is a document for discussion, concentrating mainly on the difficulties of those with neurodiversity. It must, however, be pointed out that many people with neurodiversity are excellent at math, coordination, reading, etc. We are people of extremes. Uh, and then it's a Venn diagram that shows dyspraxia, developmental coordination disorder, such as difficulty with planning movements, coordination, and practical tasks, as well as tracking and balance, poor spatial awareness, and muscle tone. Oh, uh, and that overlaps with uh, autism spectrum disorder with over and under sensitive to light and noise, touch, temperature, speech, and language difficulties. Uh, and it also overlaps with dyscalculia, with difficulties with calculation and number concepts, word finding and speech problems, uh, and also overlaps... Oh yeah, that it overlaps with dyslexia in that in that way. Uh, and then neurodiversity difficulties with organization, memory, concentration, time, direction, perception, sequencing, poor listening skills. <laughs> yeah, leading to low self-esteem, anxiety, depression. But creative, original, determined. Uh, and that seems to be where it uh, overlaps. And I'm not going to read the other ones because they don't seem to overlap with dyspraxia. But anyway. Dyscalculia is all about difficulties with calculation and number concepts, while dyslexia is, as we all know, about difficulty with reading, writing, and spelling, and Tourette's is all about verbal and physical troubles and swearing involuntarily, which has to be pointed out that uh, only a small percentage of people with Tourette's syndrome actually have the, uh, the you know, uh, uncontrollable swearing. That's just uh, one of the small aspects. It's a misconception that that's one of the symptoms of Tourette's when it's only a small group of people with Tourette's who actually do that. Most just have other kind of tics. Um, dyspraxia is much more about planning and coordination difficulties and undertaking practical daily tasks such as pouring a cup of tea without accident as well as poor muscle tone and also involves a basic lack of communication skills and does very much go in line with autism spectrum disorders as both entail being oversensitive to touch and noise and also having general speech and language difficulties, not being aware of how and when to speak and being rather obsessive in nature. For example, I will admit that I am guilty of obsessively playing back the same Doctor Who clips time after time. Mary stated to me that many times stated to me many times that dyspraxia and Asperger's are very closely linked and that many people do indeed have a bit of both. She herself was both dyspraxic and dyslexic. Uh, of course, in my experience, uh, you know, there was a time where people did think that I was on the autism spectrum. Um, I go a lot into my book uh, about the reasons why I don't believe that is so because there are a lot of really uh, specific symptoms for Asperger's and or autism spectrum disorder that don't apply to me. Um, but I just think that's worth worth noting is that there are certain symptoms that overlap for sure, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if, you know, that if you have some of the symptoms of something that you have the disorder, you know, that's the funny thing about uh, neurodiversity is that they do seem to have overlaps, but it doesn't mean that you know, like the symptoms seem to overlap and oftentimes you do have, co they are comorbid with other disorders, but you know, just because you, uh, have sensitivity to like light and sound doesn't mean that you're on the autism spectrum, you know? Um, she told me that I was not alone in having dyspraxia and prompted, promptly showed me stories of other sufferers and did in fact put me in touch with another guy who lived near me, which I was very grateful for. Until this point, I had always believed that dyspraxia was not at all a common condition and I was very much the exception as I had been at school. But as I have discovered over the years, it is in fact very common, especially in the UK. She was understanding and also very encouraging as she told me that 
as I was struggling to learn to drive, I could learn on an automatic car, and that people with dyspraxia did in fact pass their tests, even though it would admittedly take a bit longer than the average person. At the same time, she explained that it wasn't for everyone, and some people do give up and did encourage me to persevere. I did in fact pass my test on the seventh attempt after a decade, and won't forget her kind encouragement. Mary also encouraged me to pursue university life and to ensure that I got extra time in exams, which I did indeed take the initiative to do. She also told me that while I would probably face many difficulties in life with having dyspraxia, such as being clumsy, which I was already aware of, and interacting with others, I would ultimately have good days and bad days. She encouraged me to be determined and positive in spite of the handicap. She also highlighted all the difficulties others with dyspraxia had encountered, and that every case is similar, yet at the same time, different. She also gave me a lot of helpful literature and contact information for future support group events, as well as the contact details of two individuals geographically near to me. She also encouraged me to attend the DANDA pub meetings, which although I was initially reluctant to do so, I have often shied away from I have often shied away from new situations in the past. I eventually ended up going as they were, in fact, very helpful. Mary was the power behind the throne of the pub meetings and ensured that they happened very regularly. Once a month in London and encouraged everyone presented to interact with everyone and to be open and honest about the struggles and problems they had in daily life, such as not getting a joke straight away or regularly spilling tea due to poor coordination. She was keen for us to open up to one another and to be honest about the simplest struggles that we encountered, however silly it may have sounded. She created a real community by hosting the pub meetings, and we all in turn came to admire and respect her for all her care and kindness. For Mary was ultimately a mother figure who wanted the best for all of us. And while we may have had a life of struggle in many ways, from interacting with others to learning to drive, to struggles with work and our education, she was keen for all of us to adopt strategies to help manage the condition effectively, some of which I will explain shortly. She was also keen for us to raise our self-esteem and actively encouraged us all when we met to go around the room and explain, to our, explain our individual differences and difficulties. Mary made us all realize that the group was a safe haven where people could be free and wouldn't be judged, but instead understood and supported. Similarly, Mary was a great host, regularly having a huge number of people with dyspraxia for Christmas parties and letting us all roam freely around about the house and talking openly too, as well as waiting on all of us very graciously. Through the various meetings that she hosted, I learned more about other people with dyspraxia and their daily struggles, and indeed, strengths. For having dyspraxia isn't entirely a curse. For example, I have a partially photographic memory than I could have ever dreamt or dared to imagine. And a lot of these people have become good friends. As Mary was aware of how dyspraxia and other related conditions became aware how frequently the different specific learning difficulties overlapped, and as a result set up DANDA, Developmental Adult Neurodiversity Association, which was a charity working for adults with dyslexia, dyspraxia, Asperger's syndrome, and ADHD, and related conditions in 2003. She also sat on the National Aim Higher Achievability Steering Group, which aimed to get more students with dyspraxia, dyslexia, and dyscalculia into university. And the best resources for achievement and intervention read diver neurodiversity in higher education, B-R-A-N-H-E-A. -E she, saw, she saw all it as a call from God to help others, which she did in fact do very admirably. She was also on the Neurodiversity Autism Action and Advisory Group of the Disability Rights Commission. In addition, she ran a dyspraxia helpline. Aside from all her work in London and with DANDA, Mary worked tirelessly to raise awareness of dyspraxia, not only in print, but also via a variety of radio programs and newspaper articles. She also helped on an adult dyspraxia awareness for college and university teachers, careers, officers, and a 
occupational therapist and psychologist, particularly the former. Later on, she also spoke about neurodiversity. Mary was determined not only to make society aware of dyspraxia and related conditions, she also wanted to actively help those with dyspraxia to develop effective strategies for having easier and less frustrating lives. For example, in terms of communication, which is no doubt a struggle for all of us dyspraxics, obviously, uh, in my case, she was fully aware that was all com that was all communicate uniquely. No, I think he meant. She was fully aware that we all communicate uniquely and differently. For example, often being louder in terms of our speech volume and jumping from subject to subject and probably in in my case being Mr. 20 questions when I meet a person for the first time. She encouraged us to actively learn communication skills as having dyspraxia entails being born with an apparent lack of communication skills and social awareness. And that's not true for every dyspraxic. But it is important to point out that no one has perfect communication skills and a person called to learn communication skills and get better if they are determined to. Uh, I have to say that I know a lot of people with dyspraxia who have excellent communication skills and uh, in my case, you know, I don't have a problem socializing as much other than lack of confidence, but also, um, you know, I just struggle with speech and obviously you become self-conscious and you lose your train of thought. That's always difficult, but I don't have a hard time reading people or anything like that. Uh, for example, she taught me of the importance of being aware of the right time to speak and maintain good eye contact, as well as listening more and interrupting less and to calm down in your head for a lot of dyspraxics talk and think at the same time. Isn't that how you communicate? <laughs> uh, no, that is, that's one of the difficult things about dyspraxia is trying to, uh, to balance your thought and uh, speech at the same time because your mind will go a, a million miles a minute while your mouth is just kind of like, uh, what, 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 are you trying to keep up. In terms of being organized, Mary taught me the importance of planning what needs to be done at the beginning of each day and to set clear goals and prioritize tasks and allocate a specific time to do a job. More importantly, she highlighted to me the importance of having a routine and breaking a job into segments. She also taught me the importance of being determined if I was to succeed with dyspraxia. For example, she had been told by some teachers at school that she wouldn't amount to much and wouldn't go to a university. Yet, she ended up going because she was determined to prove them wrong. She also encouraged me to do repetitive things as often as possible, such as practicing handwriting as often as possible, and also to do creative writing to help relax and also to help enhance planning ability. Mary, in fact, wrote a book on dyspraxia entitled Living with Dyspraxia, which offers comprehensive advice on what dyspraxia actually is and how to brush your teeth, as well as how to get an assessment, diagnose, and treat, a diagnosis and treatment. It isn't all that easy these days, as I am sure many of many of whom reading this or hearing this will no doubt testify. The book also talks about the importance of doing relaxation exercises to help with the daily stresses of having dyspraxia and also the struggles with communication and relationships with others, particularly non-dyspraxics, and also strategies for being organized on a daily basis and in the home. It also offers practical advice on studying and help in the workplace and the right to choose. For it is true that people with dyspraxia are probably ideally suited to certain specific jobs and definitely not others. Like me with acting and writing, although my reading is, is not uh, the best when it's cold. The book also comprehensively shows how neurodiverse conditions are all similarly interrelational. Mary has also very kindly and thoughtfully acknowledged that it was hu a huge challenge to have dyspraxia in the workplace and ha gave great advice about the importance of organizing yourself effectively at work and the importance of first of all choosing the right job by identifying your key strengths and skills and also to do some sort of skills assessment if you can. In my case, I did a Morrisby profile, which helped me greatly and also factored in the fact that I have dyspraxia. She also gave helpful advice on how to write the CV and the best way to win at an interview. 
For example, to prepare mentally about the interview and what you yourself can offer the organization in terms of your skills and experiences, and also of the importance of doing role-playing with friends in terms of practicing interview. In terms of practice interview. Perhaps most importantly, she emphasized the importance of planning the journey to interview beforehand. For example, planning the train route in line with the interview time and doing a dummy run to the place the interview would be taking place in possible. In terms of starting an actual job itself, she also gave very comprehensive advice on disclosing the dyspraxia fully and clearly to the employer and then working out a good strategy to master the job. For example, ensuring clear explanations in terms of learning new concepts and a detailed set of notes. Moreover, she highlighted the plus of getting help from access to work and also a possible support worker if need to be if need be to master the job. In terms of disclosing the dyspraxia, she was also helpful in advising that under the Disability Discrimination Act that you are entitled to reasonable help and adjustments where necessary where necessary from the employer, and also that frankly, if an employer did discriminate against you, then they probably weren't worth working for anyway. I was told this by Mary in no uncertain terms, believe me. Mary was born in 1952 and had a tough time at school for being different, and she confided to me. Aside from that, she, and la she later went on to study history at Queen Mary in Westfield in London. I am pleased to say that her university life was a lot happier than her school life, and she had a great time and people were accepting of her, even though she perceived herself to be different. She did have trouble keeping a job which severely dented her self-esteem, yet ultimately found her calling by dedicating herself tirelessly to helping people with dyspraxia and other related conditions. We always knew we could rely on her to keep the community going and happy, that she was always there to confide in and to understand. It came as a great shock to hear from Facebook that she had died from breast cancer in September 2010. The memorial service at Dutch Church in London was packed. And we all remembered a truly lovely, fun-loving lady who strived to help the needy, vulnerable and marginalized, and knew what it was like to suffer and get bullied and to have other everyday life struggles yet to persevere and develop good strategies. Mary's funeral was a hard and emotional funeral to go to, as her loss was felt by many very deeply. But in a sense, it was wonderful, as it was a clear mark on the number of lives she had helped and touched. Mary was always so kind and selfless, even when she herself had been diagnosed with cancer. She confided once that she had got more sympathy for having breast cancer than for having dyspraxia, something which angers me to this day. No doubt you will all feel the same way as me. But it was encouraging that the service had such a big turnout and that people had come far and wide to remember her and that at the end of the day, at the end we sang, We Shall Overcome, as indeed Mary would have wanted us to. Indeed, we shall all overcome. Thanks to knowing Mary, I personally feel a lot better informed about dyspraxia and how to manage and maintain it, and indeed how common a condition it is. If you take 20 people walking into a supermarket, the chances are that at least one of them will have some sort of dyspraxia or Asperger's trait. But sadly, dyspraxia isn't as well known or recognized as indeed it should be in the same light as dyslexia is very well known about. I am sure that her greatest wish would be for society to be a lot better informed and educated than it is today. Mary has in fact left us all a legacy, that although some of us will have dyspraxia doesn't mean that we will have a terrible life, just a life of struggle and misunderstanding. And in my opinion, and no doubt probably hers, we who have dyspraxia aren't the problem. The ignorant and sometimes cruel society we live in is the main problem for us. If society understood a lot better than it does now, then our lives would change for the better in so many ways, particularly in terms of how we are treated by others, particularly in terms of how our perceived clumsiness and the fact 
we interact very differently to the average person. But with understanding from the world, there comes acceptance, something that Mary strived all her life to do, to educate society and to help people with dyspraxia to d develop the right strategies for life. And we can all continue to do that in her name and in her honor. In many ways, we are her legacy. Mary never asked for anything herself. She was selfless, brave, and caring. Things may have been hard for Mary in many ways, but she never complained and heroically kept going. I would like to end this tribute by thanking God for a woman who I am so proud and privileged to have known for my early adult life and who always strive to help and serve others so well for their own good. And while she did struggle herself socially, she never complained and got on with life, as we can all hopefully do today, and lead by her quite remarkable example. Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for listening. That was a very touching tribute, I have to admit. And I'm very happy to have been able to uh, read that here today on my podcast. It definitely sounds like Mary was, uh, I don't want to say a martyr. That wouldn't be the right word. Um, she definitely was a looming figure in the dyspraxic community and the neurodiversity community in general. But it seemed like she really got the ball rolling for, for dyspraxia awareness. And I don't understand why dyspraxia, why it's so much harder to educate the public and to make people aware of dyspraxia and what it is and what it's like to live with it. I don't know why it's so much harder than it is for things like dyslexia or autism. And of course, I mean, it's, it's wonderful that nowadays people understand dyslexia and autism more than they used to. Um, and there's far less stigma to it. But at the same time, it's, I don't understand why we can't have the same respect and understanding to dyspraxia. And it's like in Ro Rosemary's um, article, there's a struggle even within the dyspraxic community to unite. I apologize if you hear my neighbors in the background, they're usually very loud. Um, but uh, hopefully it won't get picked up by this mic. Anyway, I forget what I was talking about. Basically, it, it there's a struggle to unite amongst dyspraxics. And it's like this week, you know, it is Dyspraxia Awareness Week. And I've been trying to get people to come together to discuss life with dyspraxia in a group setting, like we do on our Zoom meetings that we usually do Friday nights, uh, or Friday nights in the UK. In America, it's the afternoon, but um, but nobody, you know, I wanted to do it f uh, and record it for the public, you know, because I want not just to. Because it's great that we have this community where dyspraxis can come together and understand each other. But we all understand dyspraxia. We all live with it. We understand what we're going through. It's the rest of the world that doesn't understand what we're living with. And I think the important thing is to recognize that everybody who has dyspraxia is unique. Now, I haven't, I haven't been doing this podcast for very long. I've only had two guests so far. Technically three, but that other one, one of them backed out at the last minute or changed their mind. They didn't want the interview re released. But, you know, I've 
I've talked with many different dyspraxics, and there's things that I, I see in common w- with our personalities together. But... Uh, I think my brother is home or something. No, probably my neighbors. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do this. I do this podcast at my in my apartment, usually in the living room when my brother is away at work or something. Although we are moving out very soon, uh, we're actually moving in with our parents. Um, very soon. In fact, I just talked to our apartment people, the landlords, apartment people, um, and told them that, you know, we will be moving out. They wanted us out by the 10th or not the 10th, the 20th, oh, the 10th. That would be a nightmare because it's the 7th right now. Um, by the 20th, which I don't know if we're going to be able to do that completely, but it's going to be a crazy time once again. And after this, I may not be able to do too many podcasts for a little while until I get situated into my parents' house. But whenever I do, I'll, uh, you know, I'll uh, start doing this more and just do it out of my room or something. It'll be all right. I never know how these sound. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm recording this on Audacity, and it's kind of, I see the the waves i guess the audio waves and it's like if i'm right here it's like really loud and if i'm if i'm right here then you can barely hear me it seems that way but i don't know how it sounds until afterwards anyway i really got off track there uh i was talking about something very important which is that dyspraxics need to come together and uh there needs to be more collaborations there was recently a song called dyspraxic ways by my friend mike nelson who also composed the theme music to my podcast uh which is available on spotify i think it's under his name i'm not entirely sure I i will be having him on this podcast probably to promote it pretty soon but that's one thing, too. That was a collaboration. I was talking about it on my last show with Oliver Chadwick because he collaborated with Mike and uh, Dyspraxic Help for You uh, and uh, Roy Moeller, who's another person that's going to be on my podcast pretty soon or eventually, uh, probably after my move and all that. And uh, they recorded a song. Which is great. Of course, I've written two songs based on dyspraxia, which hopefully I can do something with eventually. If not with Mike, perhaps with someone else. Uh, You know, I don't know. But there needs to be more stuff like that. And it's like I've said, you know, I'm I'm happy to do like narration for people if they want to make a video about dyspraxia. I'm happy to do more readings and I'm happy to have people on my show. And this show is for the public. It's for us. And it's for everybody who doesn't understand us so that they can understand how we interact, how we live our lives. And we can just have an open and frank discussion. And even though there's forums and there's there's like private groups and stuff and people talk about their experience, nobody wants to – it's like they want to keep their, their dyspraxia hidden and a secret. And there's absolutely no reason that you should feel the need to do that because there's nothing shameful or embarrassing about having dyspraxia. What? We struggle with certain things, you know? We're not dumb. Most dyspraxics that I know – have far more common sense than the average person you know they're they're very intelligent they're very perceptive and they understand human behavior psychology and they they just we think about things in a different way and there's a lot of things that are unique about that uh i don't know if i would be as interesting or 
whatever if I didn't have dyspraxia. And uh, I probably wouldn't have any reason to write my book, which is still a work in progress. Uh, <laughs> um, because it's affected my life in so many ways, dyspraxic ways. But people like Mary Colley have, I guess, set an example for what you can do to help those with dyspraxia and other neuro neurological disorders. And it set the ball rolling for people like Pete Guest, who is the, uh, the founder of Dyspraxia and Life magazine. And of course, people like Dyspraxic Help For You and the Theatric Dyspraxic. Although I started doing the theatric dyspraxic before I got involved in the dyspraxic circle. It's just there's there's more people speaking out and doing things about dyspraxia. And I'm I want to be a part of that as much as I can. I want to do as much as I can to not just spread awareness for dyspraxia and have people understand, but also understand that it's something that you can embrace. And it's something that is, it can be beautiful. It can make us beautiful people. It's like, uh, it's like whenever you find, you know, like a toy that's, you know, maybe it's got uh, something like a missing piece. But it's still something to cherish. You know, my stuffed animal may be missing its eye, but I still go to sleep with it every night just like you should for me no no slap that hand no 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 take a swig of this purified great value drinking water with flavor enhancing minerals I think that's about it for this podcast i have wasted a, an hour of your time but thank you for listening anyway because it helps me out it helps me feel good about myself you're helping me build my self-esteem because i really need it i needed an answer i'm not doing very good i hate myself my life is filled with self-loathing. Nah, nah, but thank you to Rosemary Richings, and thank you to my friend who uh, wanted me to read this tribute to Mary Colley, and thank you to Mary Colley, and rest in peace, you beautiful angel. And we will continue doing your work. Thank you.